I'm very pleased to introduce, introduce our third keynote speaker. Deacon James Keating, PhD, is a permanent deacon of the Archdiocese of Omaha, Nebraska. He is the director of theological formation for the Institute for Priestly Formation at Creighton University in Omaha. Among other things, he leads retreats for seminary faculty and seminary formators provided by the IPF. A moral theologian by training, Jim Keating is a popular speaker on spirituality, morality, formation, and the diaconate. He's the author of several books and numerous articles, but I will mention only a few. One is an article that, brought, that first brought him to my attention, his article entitled Contemplative Homiletics, which appeared in Seminary Journal back in 2010. We later invited him to come to Notre Dame as one of our annual Martin lecturers, that was February 2018, to elaborate on that theme. And that lecture was entitled Contemplative Homiletics, Being Carried into Reality. If you go on the Martin website, you can find a link to the video of that lecture, and I think you will find it well worth your while. Finally, I simply want to mention his most recent book. I believe it's on sale out here. I'm not sure which table I saw it at, but I do believe I saw it out there. It's entitled Remain in Me, Holy Orders, Prayer, and Ministry, published by Paulus Press this year, 2019. The title of his address today is The Mystery of Love, Beauty, and Death, the homily that is prayer. Please give a warm welcome to Deacon James Keating. Good afternoon. Thank you. Just set this up a little bit, maybe um, to invite you to listen in a certain way. There'll be discursive information, of course. But if we kind of listen into the, the depths of our hearts also, it might help the, the conversation afterwards better than just discursive ideas. So we set it up by allowing the idea to kind of settle into our hearts with a particularity. The Holy Spirit always particularizes as we universalize, but he particularizes, so we want to listen. Also, the pragmatism of where we can improve maybe our own homiletics, where we can improve our preparation for that, what the Spirit may be asking of us. So if we listen with this, uh, the conversation might be richer. So we ask the Lord Jesus just to be with us for a moment so we can receive his love. In this meditation, I'll explore how regularly preaching on love, beauty, and death at the Eucharist can lead a congregation into progressively deeper prayer. Such homilies springing from prayerful preparation reflect a process of the circulation of grace, one arising from prayer which leaves whoever has ears to hear in prayer. The circulation of grace, one arising from prayer, which leaves whoever has ears to hear in prayer. Prayerfully preparing to preach helps us to recognize where Christ abides in the text of the readings assigned on any Sunday. Over time, this capacity to recognize the living Christ in the text grows and a preacher internalizes this habit as a distinct character trait within the calling. In this way, the preacher prays to become a prophet, one who notices, one who notices where Christ reveals himself. Preachers patiently wait for Christ to appear and disclose himself 
in the prayer that is homily preparation. Which text invites the homilist attention each week as disclosed by the Spirit is normally grasped void of drama. Christ enters the preacher's heart softly, like the kind of beauty one notices only after being in its presence for a while. Beauty does not always startle. More often, it dawns quietly in our consciousness. Beauty may, of course, startle. However, its self-possessed integrity usually just draws us in. By way of this attraction, it gives birth to contemplation and wonder. Praying with the scriptures as one expecting Christ to emerge from the text is to experience this subtle beauty drawing preachers to truth. Christ's disclosing, disclosure during prayerful lexio will be objective. It will bear a truth about his mystery. And because it enfolds us in reality as truth, it will also move our hearts as beauty, calling us to respond. The homilist preaches from the fruit of prayer at the interpenetrating point between beauty's revelation in the text and its personal reception by the preacher. Homilies are born where revelation and vulnerable receptivity merge to silence interior noise. This silence allows the homilist's interior senses to see, hear, and touch the mystery as it is particularized within any preparatory Lexio Divina, any prayerful lingering in the word. By lingering in the mystery, the fruit is given in a confident voice in a local ambo, sounding healing and challenge for the sake of the church. Remote preparation for preaching always includes the sacrament of reconciliation. Truth does not reveal itself clearly through the static of unrepentant sin. In a state of sin, we can find truth in a commentary and read truth and even say truth in our homilies, but we will not know his presence as the integrating power of the eternal word become instantiated in the present. God wants to be with us in the conception and the execution of our homilies as a giver is to a gift. Any homily can be fashioned from data, but it will not be a dance. It will not allow the opportunity for deepened intimacy between the cleric and the Lord. This prayerful intimacy communicates more than information to the congregation. It communicates an invitation to seek his face, to personalize revelation within a living relationship. When we, as homilists, prayerfully prepare our words, we are making room for God. Being in a state of grace as we prepare our words bestows a spiritual vulnerability upon us. This vulnerability gifts us with a new level of radical receptivity, one that conditions us to be grateful to proclaim a simple message from the ambo, a deep, quiet, brief message that will leave our people in prayer. 
attending to scripture with an attitude of patient longing rather than order toward mastering the text by wrestling it to the ground, readies the preacher to receive its gifts when they are offered. Attending with an attitude of patient longing. The supernatural reality of what we are engaged in can never be lost. We are not simply involved in an academic understanding. A preacher moves people to an encounter. This encounter is like the one from which the very homily being delivered emerged. This does not mean the homily is a histrionic display of blustering persuasion, denoting that, quote unquote, this is from God. Just the opposite. Homilies birthed from divine encounter speak in a humble voice of assurance. The homilist sees no need to display any trace of theatrics or orchestrate the generation of emotions. In preparing to preach, we do not rummage through scripture in curiosity, nor with an impure motive to capture its secrets and therefore appear wise or clever to parishioners. We wait, we wait for scripture to reveal its truths analogous to the way a spouse in love listens to his or her beloved. The truths that spill out of one's beloved's heart are treasured and reveal, revered and held in respect. The spouse is humbled to receive a life so generously shared with him or her, a life within which he or she is participating. In the end, the spouse will know his beloved, but he refrains from publicly saying, want to know what Helen told me? Prudence around the knowledge of one's spouse shows respect for the relationship and deflates any egocentric need to reveal that one is an insider. With such precious revelation, the spouse first lets it affect him and change him according to its weight of truth and beauty. Any public action and words expressed about the spousal revelation flows from the trust that is shared, humbly reverencing the gift received from one's beloved spouse. Publicly sharing any such communication is done in a way that only strengthens the relationship. A spouse would only share with others the beauty of such an encounter with his spouse as an act of love to encourage others to enter the same kind of relationship. They too can know and be known by their beloved. That is the homily, describing the beauty of the relationship that is being offered and encouraging others to enter it themselves, especially at the altar of sacrifice. Our preaching is the fruit of our own encounter with the risen Christ in prayer and an invitation delivered to others to enter such an encounter themselves in faith. What is prayer? Prayer is our conversation with God. Yes, of course that is true. But even deeper, prayer is how we receive his love. Prayer is being loved and loving. To know this and invite others into it is why our ministry of preaching and charity is so vital. As believers and preachers, we long to become prayer and not just say prayers, to become persons who receive the love of God and proclaim its effects in preaching and charity. 
through our preaching, we lead people into prayer. And after our words fall silent, we hope they remain in prayer. When we preach upon those human realities that define our deepest desires and fears, we command the congregation's attention. Those desires and fears are fulfilled and healed as the church participates in the Paschal mystery. In all these desires and fears, God is present, waiting to be encountered, and in so being, to ignite conversions. Homilies within the Eucharist are to seize worshipers as an invitation to abandon impersonal, superficial, and ideological living and begin or deepen sustained vulnerability to the divine presence. Homilies within the Eucharist are to seize worshipers as an invitation to abandon impersonal, superficial, and ideological living and begin sustained vulnerability to the divine presence. We know the word of God carries both power and presence when preached in faith within the Eucharistic liturgy. When preaching in faith, we see the beauty of what we are proclaiming, preaching out of the beauty of what we see. In proclaiming and preaching, the preacher is seeing. The preacher not only hears or listens, but from within this arena of raptly listening to the word, the virtue of obedience, his spiritual sense of sight is paradoxically stimulated and he beholds the truth in the message, even while he's delivering it. The preacher, in other words, sees the whole and sometimes physically responds with tears or deep affective movements of the heart. The truth is never simply discursive. It is enfleshed in its own weight of beauty, enfleshed within the body of the preacher. When the preacher sees, what he sees is the generosity of God toward humanity. What he sees is always the same. This is my body given for you. Hence, the preacher's own body and the body of the church are moved in the homily to receive the divine into the soul. Again, this receiving is not vulnerability to a persuasive idea, but willing participation in a history of sacred self-donation as a response to the service of Christ's own charity. The homily then prepares a body to be given the homily prepares a body to be given in loving surrender to Christ upon the altar and sent in public mission from the mysteries. In one deep and brief burst of rhetoric, the homilist desires to expel the congregation's entanglement in sin, lies, and artificial consolations so that they may embrace the one who is good and true and beautiful. The homilist desires to expel so that the congregation may embrace. He who is the fullness of reality's mystery will soon be the one placed upon the altar for worship. It is he we are called to embrace. This expulsion and embracing, this surrender and mission by the members of the church is the result of an encounter with the risen Christ in the graced words of proclamation, saturated in his presence at the liturgy of the word become Eucharist, we gradually, developmentally, and relationally 
enter the depth of human existence by way of Christ's own capacity to love. We enter the depth by way of Christ's own capacity to love. The radiance of his beauty is self-donative, culminating in a surrender to death. The homilist contemplation of these self-donative mysteries in Christ leads the bride into sustained and substantive prayer. Such prayer always births martyrs. Such prayer always births witnesses to what they have received in their bodies as grace. As the preacher delivers us the liturgy of the word to the altar of self-donation and the fountain of life, the liturgy of the Eucharist, we meditate upon the beauty of Christ's love. By doing so in faith, he meets us and invites us to participate in his own self-revelatory love, participate in a love through worship and witness. As his crucifixion was public, so ought our love be for one another. This call to public witness is born in baptism and sustained when we enter Christ's own self-donation eucharistically. By way of worship, our knowledge of the mysteries advances not so much in breadth as in depth, so deep that these mysteries fasten themselves to our will, affect, and mind, igniting again and again a new history of enfleshed holiness. What is the effect when we hear the word that the homilist sees? What is the effect when we hear the word that the homilist sees when this word is preached during the Eucharist? Such a word readies us to receive anew and to remain within the salvation being offered. The homily within the sacramental actions of the church, bears witness to one thing, what God has done for us in Christ. The effect of worship upon us is to remain in him, to become one with him and one another. We are formed into such a unity with Christ that we bear the brand marks of his worship as we are sent out into culture. What are the brand marks? Since an authentic homily can only bear the truth, this truth causes wounds to open within our consciences. These wounds are deep impressions in our heart, lacerating them and rendering our hearts no longer responsive to ideology or partisan advantage. This kind of homily moves us from superficial preoccupations to engage love, mortality, and beauty. Having been cut open by the proclaimed word, we are made ready to participate in holy communion at the altar. Such an encounter with the living word is not given to satisfy personal piety alone or simply express the church's worship the fruit of what is given and received is meant to be seen in culture. Members of Christ, we are all members of one another. In this spacious body, love circulates as divine human blood. We are identified in Christ with the whole Adam. Our own selves no longer interest us. The ultimate effect of worship is the transformation of us into persons no longer interested in the I. Worship is not about transmitting data or stirring up consoling emotions. Worship seeks to circulate love like blood in a body. Any information transmitted by the homilist 
or emotions that arise are in service of our participation in the mystery of Christ's own sacrifice. Yet I live no longer I, but Christ lives in me. In worship, the individual within the community comes to progressively and relationally inhabit and be inhabited by a new reality, the mind, the body of the one Christ. From this inhabitation, contemplatively reflected and acted upon and ignited by sacramental symbols, Catholic culture and mission is born. The liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the Eucharist sustain, deepen, and regenerate our faith life, substantially providing for our capacity to suffer life's mysteries, love, beauty, death, and to suffer these mysteries in faith. What is love? Christian anthropology argues that we all desire the love of God. If we do not find rest in such love, we weave a life out of wandering rather than receiving. Bernard Lonergan called this drifting, a life of drifting. If we do not receive the love of God as rest, we live out a life of wandering rather than receiving. Therefore, what could be a life of confidence become, becomes a life of insecurity and anxiety. We become weary trying to hold all meaning in ourselves. Sustained self-centeredness cannot be hidden, and this emotional weariness becomes uncomfortably obvious to all. We cannot hold ourselves together. We can only receive ourselves from within a communion initiated and sustained by the Holy Trinity. Homilists announce love in the midst of love itself being offered at Mass. Can parishes assist their people to become contemplatives, listening, always listening anew for the movement of God in the Word, in their hearts, and in their culture? Can worship heal our notion of identity derived only from popular and political culture? and give us sustained and authentic identities derived from holy communion. Homilists announce new life, even as life itself is being offered through the Mass. However, simply relying, relaying to congregations that they are loved can raise anger in some. It makes the people soft, some say, to tell them they are loved. They need to live in discipline, stop sinning, and buck up. Others enjoy the focus upon love in its generalities because it casts the world in a gauzy, soft light, leaving no room for moral judgment or the encouragement needed to recover from the suffering born in choosing deadly sins. Oh, Father, you're always so positive. Thank you. But divine love has its own agenda. Divine love has its own agenda, and it cannot be manipulated. The homilist calling is to leave the congregation in the presence of love not a caricature of it. The homilist calling is to leave the congregation in the presence of love, a love already saturating the mass, making it the best place to leave people alone with God while being together with one another. We do not convince people of God's love. We simply leave them with him to be loved. After the homily is concluded, our trust must be ignited, and any temptation to help God move people should be avoided. 
We have already helped God. We preached his good news. We deliver this message within the saturated arena of God's love at Mass so that those who have ears to hear will be astonished at the generosity of God's providence and those who finally see will own the human condition and ask, what must we do to be saved? The homilist leaves the congregation with God and God, who is love, is simply left to be God so we, his creatures, may receive him as love and either enter his joy or refuse to. That is the drama of our lives. We are gathering week after week in hope. Receiving the sacrament of God's love enables us to participate in the mystery of his saving acts. The homilist regularly reminds the congregation at the Eucharist that they have come to the well of salvation. The Eucharist is the weak point in creation, wherein God is made readily available through signs to minister to our need to be loved, forgiven, and healed. And thus we are enabled to give praise and adoration. The Eucharist is the weak point in creation. Ultimately, the homilist shares the truth of the gospel as the fruit of contemplative study and prayer because the force and beauty of truth demands that it be shared. The congregation is also invited to go and do likewise because they, like the homilist, know the truth and society waits to be served by those so converted by divine love. Rightfully, the truth of this love is delivered from the sacred altar to a culture more and more unfamiliar with it. Love's human face, suffering the death of selfishness, is instinctually repulsive to us as we guard the isolation of self and resist meeting God at the cross. Divine love looks like crucifixion on earth, and the homilist points to it as the preacher descends the ambo, making way for the altar of sacrifice. Thus, true love is defined by its origin in the sacred. More and more, love is instinctually repulsive, for we resist meeting God at the cross. What is beauty? Clinging to any form of created beauty as an absolute is to idolize it and make it an end in itself. But Christ is beauty, beauty itself. We see his beauty radiating from his divine sonship and displayed in his salvific acts throughout the New Testament. The homilist is invited to point out the beauty of God by precisely describing Christ's canonic actions which meet our human need. Our desire to rest in beauty's arms, to have our restless reason calmed and our anxious wills stilled, can begin to be satisfied by the liturgy of the Eucharist and the revelation of Christ as beauty become flesh. For now, Christ's beauty is not physical. We do not know his face. Rather, his beauty is metaphysical and behavioral. In his actions revealed in scripture toward the blind man or the woman by the well or the Samaritan by the roadside, we behold both the pinnacle of human compassion and the revelation of God as beauty. Such beauty moves us at the deepest level. Within these acts, which minister to our deepest human wounds, divine beauty attracts, invites, and draws us in. In the end, the homilist demonstrates the beauty of Christ in the Gospels, and the congregation becomes vulnerable to uniting with Christ in the Eucharistic feast. He demonstrates the beauty 
so that the congregation becomes vulnerable. From this union at the Eucharistic feast, we will go and do likewise. The Eucharist is the feast that satisfies and sends. In Jesus, we contemplate beauty and splendor at their source, the concrete way in which the truth of God's love in Christ encounters, attracts, and delights us, enabling us to emerge from ourselves. Christ's own actions toward humanity communicates consolation, the consolation of beauty giving itself. Within this consolation, we move out of ourselves and become possessed by the mystery of salvation. What is death? It is a great gift for the homilist to regularly reflect upon death and how Christ enters it and transfigures it from an end to a beginning. In this way, the congregation is not left to be guided by other cultural ruminations about death, ruminations not intrinsically ordered to culminate in prayer or flow from the Paschal mystery. Dying and death remain the most mysterious of realities whose inevitable approach carry fear and dread, even for believers. Clerics are to be experts in dying and death because so much of the spiritual life engages them in assisting others to let go, let go of egos, let go of control, and in the end, to let go of their own bodies to physical death. Helping people die in peace fulfills a cleric's desire to serve persons in their vulnerability before mystery, ushering them into real communion with Christ's own desire. Today, you will be with me in paradise. But such happy endings only arise from passing through bodily suffering as we remain faithful to the God who appears powerless to help us. The greatest darkness a homilist peers into is the desolation of those who are suffering and dying void of divine consolation. I do not feel the love of God, only my isolation. Here in the deepest unity with Christ on the cross, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? In pain, the homilist deepens the congregation's preparation to surrender at the altar of Calvary. In so doing, the preacher opens a door to light, but only in and through the darkness of going where Christ went in his own forsakenness. Of course, inside death is the resurrection, but to rush there does an injustice to the varied and multiple ways people of faith experience dying and death. Some smile in joy through their pain, and some endure a seemingly endless procession of daily pain and temptation. But from within what more grace-filled arena is there than the Eucharistic liturgy itself to stare down death? All these anthropological realities, love, beauty, and death, are places of Christological encounter. Within them, our bodies engage the body of Christ sacramentally. Such realities call to us from the core of our beings. To ignore these realities is absurd. A culture that does not attend to beauty, dying, love, becomes dehumanized. Alternately, attending to these in Christ is the rectification of reason and the reestablishment of culture based upon sound anthropology. Preachers lead congregations into these foundational realities suffused with Christ's own light and grace. 
Christ himself fills love and beauty and death with healing and orients them toward Trinitarian life in his decision to go all the way in to humanity. Unveiling such truth from the ambo is a preacher's dignity. Homilies gaze upon these human mysteries, inviting divine encounter. And encounter always silences. In liturgical silence, the paschal mystery is given an opportunity to engage us at the heart of our own deepest wonderings about love, beauty, and death. A preacher who enters these themes in and with Christ's own history of doing so leaves the congregation in the deepest of silence, a silence filled with presence, a silence that is therefore prayer. Such silence, born of proclamation and preaching, is always silence suffused with awareness. Such interior silence is not simply rest from noise, but is instead a response to presence, a presence with whom, at the completion of the homily, we now enter holy communion at the altar of sacrifice and glory. And from such holy communion comes the power of public witness, the public glory of the church itself. Thank you.